It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! This week, starring special guest star, Miss Callie J. <laughs> and I just realized I didn't open up the chat room, so let me get that open. Whoa, man, there's like a million chatters in there. Pop out chat. Yes, I can do that. And there they are. There that is. This goes away. Okay, I am technologically ruling the world. Hello, is there folks. A way for me to see the chat on my end. Uh, you'd have to log in to the link that everybody is. Um, but I'll tell you what we're gonna do is I'm gonna try and do like an hour with you, and then when we get to about the hour mark, then I'm gonna take questions from people and I'll filter them and feed them to you. Sweet. So anyway, welcome to the show. Um, I'm excited to have you here because uh, you're like taking off like a rocket, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. Um, Callie has been a taxi member now. Uh, she, she's an artist, songwriter, and top liner from the Atlanta area. You should know that. Um, been a member for about three and a half years. She's had placements in TV commercials for Coke, Samsung, Bose, Nintendo, Nestle, Hyundai, United Healthcare, Google Play, Google Pixel, Pixel Pizza Hut, that's the important one right there, um, Target, Nordstrom, Peloton, and more. Did they send you a free Peloton is the big question. My, I've got two older daughters that are 40 and 38, and they love their Peloton. Yeah. Um, she's also had a bunch of TV placements and shows like Vanderpump Rules, The Resident, Empire, Younger, the Hills, Tiger Woods, Chasing History, Hustle in Brooklyn, Young and the Restless, Power, X on the Beach, and many more. And maybe the most fascinating thing about your story, Kelly, is the fact that you somewhere, I think in an interview you did with Bria about a year and a half ago when you were our passenger profile, you actually said the words, I knew at 12 years old that I wanted to grow up and do music for TV commercials. Like, how is that even possible that you knew that at 12? I have I have no idea. I mean, I've been playing instruments since I was six and everything, but why on earth I was dreaming of writing jingles and stuff at 12, I have no idea. I do know um, maybe what sparked it off was there is a radio contest to write a holiday jingle for, uh, I believe it was O'Charlie's. And I submit, it was like parody. It took a, what's her name, Mariah Carey song. And I, I wrote, oh, Charlie's lyrics to one of her <laughs> songs. And I, I won the competition and they like sang my my version of the, you know, Charlie's jingle on, on the air. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Like, it's amazing. So. I wonder yeah. how they got the, the publishing side of that uh, cleared. I mean, I great idea. that you got to do it on the air. But. <laughs> I would imagine the Columbia Records probably sent out a team of people like ninjas or something to take care of the radio station after that. Yeah, shut it down. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, the, you also write stuff. I, I, I'm fascinated. I, I mean, I know you a little. You know, I've met you at the road rally. You and I hung out for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes at the Hawaii Songwriters thing two years ago, I think, the last one, I think, that was a live one. Um, and, uh, but I don't think I understood. I, I knew you were taking off like a rocket. I didn't understand the depth of your talent, the depth of your ability, and the range of stuff that you do. Uh, I mean, you're best known in our circles, and maybe in the industry now, is this lady who you know, top lines commercials and sings commercials with all this spunk and the sass and you do it so well that you're a brand, you know? I mean, it, you are a brand. And but by the same token, I, I listen to just about everything that you've done that I could find that, that's on the internet. And you've got some stuff that's really like tender and heartfelt that's like guitar, acoustic guitar vocal. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you do it. I, I told Callie before we went on the air, the worst thing she's got online is an A minus. And the only reason it's an A minus is because the other stuff is all A plus. So by comparison, but how, how do you like shift gears for all those different mindsets and styles and do it so well? 
for me it's it's fun like from an artistic level i don't think i could ever land on one single genre that i was like yes this is me as an artist so for sync it's just fun to be able to kind of flip flop depending on the day and what briefs come in and everything so it's just a it's a source of like creative freedom getting to write in a bunch of different genres and i love being able to hop around like that you know from day to day um are there any genres that that like make you go nah i can't do that just because it's a weird genre for you um i would say i mean latin latin vibe stuff is maybe is harder and trailer music i'd love to get into that um but that's something i haven't quite figured out quite yet i'm working on it uh, are you yeah. talking about like the kind of ethereal, dreamy, slow, reverb drenched kind of trailer stuff? Yeah, just like the slow, epic build kind of haunting vocals. That's something I haven't done too much of yet. So I'd, I'd like to get into that for sure. Okay. Um, did you have any vocal training as a kid or were you just, you know, is your voice a gift from God? Because it's really good. <laughs> I would say it's a gift of God for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I took vocal lessons off and on maybe, you know, six months here, six months there, just kind of bounced around. I moved around a lot. So it was just kind of here and there. But yeah, I've just kind of been singing forever. Wow. Um, and did you study music theory or go to like music school, Berkeley, any of that stuff? Or are you just somebody who listened and learned? Yeah, no, I'm the worst music theory student ever. <laughs> I, I basically know nothing about music theory. So I've tried, I've definitely tried, but I just, I gloss over. I can't seem to really get into any real meat of music theory. So I'm definitely a, a listen and learn kind of approach, just kind of writing by ear. Um, what do you listen to recreationally? Can you listen recreationally or, or have you been ruined by the industry, make, you know, analyzing everything to death? I <laughs> haven't been ruined quite yet. No, I still I still enjoy listening to music. And um, I guess in my free time, I like to listen to mainly like hip hop and dance, kind of EDM dance music. And then, you know, some singer songwriter stuff. You know, I still play guitar. I still like to listen to those kind of songs too. But I like how from every genre, you can pull new little bits of inspiration that you can, can then work into your sync music, so. Yeah, it's funny. A lot of people say, you know, we're going through this terrible time in the music industry. Honestly, I think it's one of the best times in the music industry because everything is not pigeonholed into just top 40. I mean, with the advent of Spotify and other streaming services that I hear amazing stuff from people who are unknown all the time. I hear amazing stuff from taxi members and go, I think we're in kind of a, a golden age. Um, I mean, the fact that you can have kind of you know mindless top 40 pop and ed sheeran out there at the same time yeah you know. and tiktok tiktok is a huge platform now in terms of launching music and kind of setting music trends so i definitely uh definitely spend a lot of time on that app <laughs> but i justify it by saying oh i'm, I'm learning new new music tricks so <laughs> Um, do you take notes when you hear something that's cool or that you like or does it just stick in your brain uh, if I hear a song, I'll definitely, um, you know, go look up the artist and everything and, and kind of dive into their music a little bit. And then, you know, for the next co-write I do with my, my co-writers and everything, I like to send them, you know, new references and stuff like, oh, maybe we could do something in this direction. And it's just new stuff we're all kind of discovering as we go through the day. Um, I know that you uh, started out writing for country, or started writing for yourself as an artist, but realized that you needed to expand. You were doing stuff that I think you said was kind of countryish, kind of songwriter, singer songwriterish, um, and but you at some point realized that you needed to like break out and do stuff that was for a broader market, and that you wanted to write with other people. Um, it, it's funny how you've gone kind of full circle because in in doing that it seems like you've become a brand do you have to think about which projects you'll take on what kind of music you'll work on what your name can go on because you don't want to spread the brand too thin or anything yeah no absolutely it was it's kind of ironic because when I first got into sync it was like I had abandoned 
the whole artist thing, you know, I was like, I'm just gonna write for sync behind the scenes and not really worry about it. But over the course of kind of developing my sound, I inadvertently created a brand and kind of an artist name in and of itself that's then related to sync. Um, but yeah, no, in terms of, of writing for the brand and all that stuff, I think I've definitely had to be a little strategic in terms of um, not only what songs I release under Cali J, like uh, not every song is going to be under Cali J. I have a couple other aliases that I put music out under as well. And um, yeah, and even work for hires. Like I used to do a lot of work for hires for vocals, but then I got to the point where I was like, hey, am I over? I don't want to oversaturate the market with my voice. And if I am going to oversaturate it, I'd rather it be all my originals, you know? Right. So I've had to dial back the work for hires as well. But no, it's it's been cool kind of watching the, the brand grow and evolve. Sounds like you've got a pretty good business head. Um, I don't want to pry into your family life, but are either of your parents business people or anything? It's like, or were you just born with this natural ability to understand marketing and branding and the business side of your artistic life? Yeah, so I would say my dad is definitely my business mentor. Um, he's been in, in you know corporate real estate for 30 years, but I think he's always had that kind of entrepreneurial bug in him. So I... I bounce everything off of him and he helps kind of guide me and give me advice and stuff. Um, and that's been super helpful, but I also have a, a marketing degree. So I think, Oh, um, there's that. <laughs> I try to, I try to base things off of like just a purely a marketing perspective when writing for, for sync and everything. So just balance of the artistic and in the business side of things. It's really hard for most people to do. And I definitely see, that the greater percentage of Taxi's successful members, no matter if their success is, you know, making five grand a year in sync or a hundred thousand a year in sync, that that striking that balance of business and the artistic side is something that they've all got in common. I, and I'm never sure if people are, are born with the ability to do that or if they recognize it because so many artistic people are like, hey man, just let me take care of the art and somebody else should take care of all this businessy stuff. So yeah. um, did you recognize that at some point? Were, were you ever that artsy fartsy person that was just all about the art and then you went, oh, this is becoming something? Or did you know from the beginning that you'd have to balance? Yeah, no, I've, I've always been pretty, I've always had a kind of business approach to it. Um, because I, I mean, I used to gig for a living, so I knew I had to go out there and like pound the pavement and talk to, reach out to new restaurants and talk to managers and just work that or else I'm, you know, not going to make any money. I'm not going to get any gigs. So I knew that the business side was just as important as, you know, just playing, playing songs. So when it came to sync and everything, it also just comes down to, you know, no one's going to work your music as hard as you are. So, you know, why not just apply that and, and push your music as hard as you can and meet new people and just get it in as many hands as you can. So I've always just kind of had that approach. When you were gigging, how many gigs a week did you play? What was the nature of the gigs and what kind of music did you do, Adam? So I got up to about 150 shows a year. They were all wow. about four hours um, and just, just cover gigs. Um, I would occasionally slip in an original, but you know, the restaurants are paying you to play music their customers know. So it was predominantly cover gigs on my loop pedal and guitar and stuff. <laughs> Do a lot of Ed Sheeran, so. All right, um, what were some of the other artists that you like to cover? Um, I did, I mean, I did everything from Fleetwood Mac to Fetty Wap and Lady Gaga and, you know, Colby Clay, Maroon 5, Ed Sheeran, um, Katie Tunstall, One Republic, just, just kind of oh. like top 40 stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But pretty tasty top 40. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> um, so I think that it was like, two years ago, maybe almost three years ago now that I was moderating an A&R panel at the Hawaii Songwriters Festival that I've been to almost every year it's been on. Um, and I was moderating this panel and we played your song that you co-wrote with Robin Shore, I believe, uh, mm -hmm. called Look At Me. 
And I remember, I, I don't think we were 15 seconds into it. I went, okay, there's a winner. I'd never heard it before. I don't even know that, I think maybe you and I had met for a split second or something, but I, I just remember thinking, oh, if they don't realize this is awesome, then it's a panel full of idiots up there. <laughs> Sorry, guys, because I know most of them are friends of mine. But, um, anyway, it got a very enthusiastic response. I think the, the ballroom exploded on that one, and the panel was like, wow, that's really good. And somebody said on the panel, so did you write that for sync? And as I was telling Kelly before we went live on the air, whoever it was, I'm sure it was somebody I'm friends with, I kind of wanted to punch him because it's like really, and not that I go around punching people, you know, figuratively speaking, I wanted to punch them because it's like either a great song that's syncable or it's not. But that was the moment where I realized how important the artist thing became, had, was becoming and has become um, for sync, especially for TV commercials where they're looking for authenticity. I mean, you couldn't listen to that song and not think, okay, I could place this in 10 different commercials like in about a week. Um, but they wanted to know if you wrote it for sync or you wrote it as an artist because they were looking for that answer of like, oh, I just wrote it as an artist. It just happens to work well for sync. I personally think, you know, it, it, it's almost like a form of musical racism, although it has nothing to do with race, but can a song just be judged on the content of the song, you know, not on the exterior stuff? Yeah. Um, so how do you deal with that? I mean, you are a brand now and, and you're becoming a, a pretty well-known brand as a sync writer and as an artist. How do you feel about I, let me restate that or re-ask the question a different way. Does that ever enter into your writing? Um, do you have ever think to yourself, no, this sounds too much like sync. What would I do if I were just an artist and not even thinking in terms of sync? Or does none of that even enter the equation? Um, well, first off, I would take the comment at the panel as a compliment because I feel like a lot of people... <clears throat> tend to think that there's like a stigma or, or something about sync music that it's cheesy and it's just so obviously sync. So if you can walk the line where it works for sync, but it also sounds authentic to, or it sounds like it could be an artist song, then you've struck a really good balance. And I, I wrote that one with Robin Shore and Jacob Federici. I want to give them a shout out. But, um, but yeah, no, I think in terms of writing for stuff, at least on my co-writes, we're generally still more sync focused because there are obviously a, a lot of more things we could write about if I was, you know, just freely writing for myself as an artist. Um, but we, but that's that comes down to being strategic with writing. Like we really, really set up, I guess, guardrails for ourselves while we're writing to make sure that what we're doing is so finely tuned for advertising that you know we're not wasting our time writing songs that won't necessarily work like we're trying to create a product that's gonna go out there and, and you know make a name for itself so we're, we're strategic in that way but i think we're definitely more sync focused as opposed to artists if it happens to work for artists then that's just a win-win let's talk about the rules of writing music for advertising um can you give us kind of a bullet point list um well, I guess I've actually been reflecting back on that a little bit because when I was first getting into sync, I was writing more for film and TV. <clears throat> and then uh, I decided to switch over to advertising. And I noticed there were some differences. Um, and even now what I'm what I'm finding is all ad music works for ads and film and TV. Like we're still getting TV placements with our ad music. But in my, at least in my experience, songs written for film and TV don't cross over really so much in the ad space. So there are definitely differences. I think you have more freedom when writing for film and TV. You can write about a broader, you know, thing of subjects and lyrics and tempos and, and genres and everything. I think it's a little narrower in terms of writing for advertising. Um, for the most part, they only want upbeat kind of swagger stuff. 
Um, there's definitely certain sounds or instruments that are currently trending. So it's, you know, it's smart to incorporate those and to add music and evolve as those are changing and everything. And then lyrically, there's a, you know, a smaller little group of, of lyrical concepts that work for ads. Um, you know, there's like the togetherness, there's, you know, champion and overcoming and winning. There's the swagger and confidence um, kind of vibe. And then there's a fourth one, and I always forget the fourth one. Home. But, yeah, home is a great one. Um, but, yeah, so there, there are differences. I think with film and TV, you have a little more freedom. Advertising is a little narrower, but it's just fun. It's, I, just, I, I love writing for ads. So I love listening to ad music. I, I'm... I am spoiled for life um, or injured for life. I'm not sure which, but yeah, I, I can't watch. My wife and I will be watching TV and I'm pointing out the music in commercials. Do you see why that worked? And she's like, oh, I think I'm going to go get a cookie, you know? Um, no, I just hear ads and I get jealous. I'm like, oh my gosh, who wrote that? Like, that's amazing. I wish I wrote that one. So, um, but it's just inspiration for the next one. I, I read a quote the other day from a music library owner and I was a little surprised and the quote was something I'm paraphrasing here along the lines of universal lyrics are mattering a little bit less these days and I've noticed that I've mentioned it on a couple of previous taxi TVs yet most library owners I know want universal lyrics as often as possible because they never know what which briefs are coming in and, and so the more things it could apply to the better um how much have you seen any lessening of universal lyrics or the desire to have universal lyrics and ad music i know it still has to be broad in general you know it can't be your life story i always use the reference you know i met debbie under the arch in st louis on a snowy Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, you know, I mean, that's totally unusable for anything unless there's a movie about some guy meeting a woman named Debbie in St. Louis under the arch on New Year's Eve and it's snowing. Um, have you had any feedback from the industry? Have any briefs said, you know, we, we're more concerned about authenticity, less concerned about the university, universality of lyrics, anything like that? Um, I haven't seen that so much on the brief side, but I have definitely picked up on that trend, even just hearing newer ad music and stuff and commercials and also kind of studying and keeping up to date with other people that are writing for ads. There's a one group, um, what's a, what their name, uh, Floyd Wonder, I believe. I think they're signed to Position Music or something. But um, yeah, some of their lyrics, I mean, they're killing it in the sync game. But if you look at like their verse lyrics, it's something like, I'm in the Vatican drinking with the Pope, you know, something, 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 French toast. Like it's very specific. You wouldn't think it works, but they're killing it in the ad game. So I definitely think that's opening up in some in some ways. And I know for me personally, with my co-writers and stuff, when we're working, I like to, I, I personally like to have the first verse is for the brand or you know the licensing company or whatever so we keep that one more general um you know more applicable to sync and then the second chorus or the second verse i'm like that one's for us so we can have a little bit more fun we're a little more flexible with the lyrics on that one and then hopefully that's like the best of both worlds with the, the end product um how would you weight your effort on choruses versus effort on verses. And I know the, the politically correct answer is, we give everything 110%. But I, if I were writing music for ads, I would really stress the choruses because almost every time that's what gets used. Um, how, how do you feel about chorus versus verse and how you weight things and all that? Yeah. Great, great question, huh? <laughs> no, very good. Look, um, no, it's really important. And in, in I would say almost all my co-writes, we kind of work backwards. Like, you know, we, mm. we write the choruses, we build the choruses, and then we just write verses that help support that. Because we just want to make sure that the tag is a solid concept, obviously, that would work well for. And then, you know, the chorus is just this cool, big, vibey, thing that you know supports it and then the verses are kind of I don't want to say an afterthought but they just help complete the picture but the the chorus is definitely the foundation of the song for sure 
in most instances, and maybe it's 50-50, maybe it's not, um, is it a track that comes to you and then you top line it and sing it? Or is it that you have an idea, um, which is probably a chorus that's been top lined in your brain and probably a little sketch on tape, figuratively speaking. Um, uh, which way does the process go or does it go both ways? So I am 100% the track comes first and then I write ideas over it. I would love to be the writer that like, you know, is constantly doing voice memos on my phone with new ideas and sending that to producers. <laughs> but as of right now, that is not my, my creative process. No, the, the track always comes first. That's got to be hard. I mean, obviously, it's not that hard for you because you're killing it. But I, I can't imagine. I've been around music and studios and musicians my entire adult life. And I can't imagine getting a track and then being able to come up with a melody and a lyric. I mean, where do you start? How does that happen? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how people work the other way. Honestly, I, I want to go find writers that write the, the idea first and then pick their brain about that. But I know for me, I don't know. I feel like I'm, if I'm just writing a, a song idea, I feel like I'm limited by maybe my own internal tempo. I, this might sound weird, but I feel like we all kind of have like our own internal tempos and stuff. And I personally am limited by that or, you know, the genre, I'm not naturally going to write hip hop lyrics if I don't hear a hip hop beat or something like that. So I personally love getting tracks from producers that are different genres and tempos and keys and all this stuff. And it's just like, oh, like I, that's inspiration. I can write an idea to that, but I might not naturally just come up with that idea, you know? So when you get a track from a producer, um, and they've gotten a brief that they then share with you. Maybe they share it with you when they first get it so you can start rattling ideas around um, and while they're working on the track. When you get it, you're exceptionally talented at your word flow and the use of syncopation and very, very, uh, you're completely on the money with the rhythmic aspect of your lyrics, both in the writing and your delivery as a singer, which is a big part of, top 40 music right now and, and you completely nail that so you've got a track from them and now you've got a there's an old expression about putting 10 pounds of cow poo in a five pound bag um somehow you do it magically where you're able to get these very simple thoughts in a very syncopated way in a track that somebody else built that just that boggles my mind. And like I said, I, I've been in the industry for longer than you've probably been alive. And w how do you do that? <laughs> I'm amazed. I'm, I mean, I'm honestly not really sure. I, I just do think it's important. Like the lyrics really are the, the cadence, like the rhythm of the lyrics is a hook in and of itself. You're adding yeah. another layer over the track. And for me, you know, syllable counts I'm just OCD I need all my syllable counts to like match and the lines need to be even and I think in doing that making sure your syllable counts are the same that just emphasizes the hook of the lyrical rhythm and everything when the the syllables are the same and they line up and everything so it's just um a subconscious kind of let's let's add another hook to it you know it doesn't necessarily just have to be the instrumental parts but the the vocals just from a sonic standpoint can can add another hook element your lyrics are very kind of streetwise and, and i mean clearly you know you don't hang out right exactly but it's like you've got that part of you but yet you're not that person i don't think you grew up on the mean streets of atlanta or anything um but well, one of your lyrics was uh, you rhymed saucin with tossin i believe um, I can't remember which song it was in, but I heard that and I went, I don't even know what saucin means, but I'm sure it's appropriate because you sold it so well in, in the song. And just like, how the hell does she come up with saucin and tossin? Um, how have you developed your young, hip, of the street, very much current, in fashion vocabulary? because that's something that sticks out to me. You've got a great lyric writer's vocabulary. Thank you. Um, I think that's just a matter of, 
uh, just kind of staying on top of trends and stuff. I certainly, you know, am not in everyday conversation going to hear some of those terms or words and everything, but um, just in current, you know, pop and hip hop music, you might hear a new phrase or something and you're like, oh, what? And I have to go to like Urban Dictionary. What does this even mean? And then I'm like, oh, well, you know, that might work for sync or something or TikTok or, I mean, I have a sister that's five years younger than me, so she's definitely maybe a little more in tune with stuff sometimes. And <laughs> she can tell her her old sister, you know, what's cool <laughs> now. But um, no, it's just kind of keeping your ear to the ground and, and staying on top of, of what's popular. Oh, you do it really, really well. And, and speaking of TikTok, they wouldn't let me in. They said I was too old. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't operate TikTok. That's what it was. <laughs> I didn't know which way to swipe or which button to click. Um, um, I want to go back to conferences for a minute. I know uh, I was actually looking up your phone number in our database to call you a little while ago, and I saw that you've been to three road rallies. Um, I, I get so frustrated that we've got like, I don't know, four times as many members as people who show up at the road rally. And I can't believe that not everybody comes to the road rally. I understand it's tough to get time off work. I understand a plane flight is three or 400 bucks. I understand the hotel, even if you share the room with somebody, is gonna be a few hundred bucks. So, but the conference is free. Uh, so that's why we've made it free so that it could be more affordable for people. How has the Taxi Road Rally, or has the Taxi Road Rally worked for you? Has it helped you build your career? What have you learned there? That sort of stuff. 100%. So first off, I would say for anyone, I mean, I don't know if we'll have an in-person one this year, but if there's ever another in-person one, I highly recommend. Um, I had just graduated college when I when I heard about the, the, the first Taxi Road Rally, and I'd never been to a music convention before. And I'm definitely an introvert at heart, so it took a, it took some, um, I guess, some pep talks on my end to convince myself to go to the the first road rally. But it, that literally changed my life. I mean, I'm not being dramatic in any way. The <laughs> I met so many people. The the taxi road rally community is just so amazing, so supportive. Everyone's just trying to help everyone, and I learned so much from it. I mean, when I was first getting into sync, even the the taxi TVs, I had them on like a podcast, like all the time. I was just listening to everyone talk and just trying to absorb as much information as I could. But the road rallies are just they're awesome, and it's just fun to like see friends that you might not have seen in a year. It's great. It's just a nice little social, but you know, professional convention it's awesome well thank you for saying that uh, I'm a big believer in it because I see how it changes lives and it just breaks my heart for everybody who can't come or doesn't come people must think well you know I'll get to it next year and they don't realize they just cost their career a year um, I mean it sounds like the the rally was the launching pad f for your career Absolutely. Um, I think you mentioned that you heard the names Matt Vanderbo and Marcus Cohen at the road rally, but didn't actually meet them at the road rally, but contacted them after the fact. So if you hadn't gone to the road rally, you might, I guess you might have heard about them on taxi TV maybe, but um, yeah, it's just, I, I, I beg people to come and they find every reason in the world why they can't. Now, obviously, if you know if you have a medical issue or God forbid a death in the family or something, those are good reasons not to come, but like, oh, I can't get the time off work. Um, call in sick. <laughs> I don't want to encourage anybody to lie, but call in sick. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's totally worth it. Like honestly, it, it you can meet so many people that can help open other sync doors for you and, and introduce you to other opportunities. So it's it's definitely worth it for sure. Did you know that sync was your goal when you came to the rally at first? Yeah. So when I was a senior in college, I was I was getting a marketing degree, but I also got a um, music entertainment and business certificate program, kind of like a minor thing. And as part of that program, I got an internship at a music licensing library, um, which w initially kind of introduced me to the world of sync and everything. And I just thought it was so cool. And I had been writing for local artists in the Atlanta area for 
you know, a year or two. But I was disappointed because the music would be released and it, it just felt like it was just sitting there. Like nothing was really happening. You know, it's just local artists releasing music and they were very talented. But I was hoping to, you know, do a little bit more with the music. So after having that internship, then I graduated college. I was like, this is this is what I'm going to do. So that's when I got on the internet and was just trying to figure out how to even start. And that's when I, you know, found the, the taxi road rally and everything. And that was the, the first thing I did. Well, I'm glad you did. Cause it does take, I, I believe it or not, I, I'm an introvert. If I hate going to parties, I hate going to anything where there are a bunch of people in a room. I get a little claustrophobic with people standing around me. Um, <laughs> I would much rather stand in the corner at a party and talk to my wife or a good friend all night than be like, hey, how are you? How about those bears? You know, it's just not who I am. So I really feel for people that say, you know, it's like I want the knowledge that you could get at the rally, but I can't get over the hump of just going there. And then, not unlike yourself, you get there, you walk into the room, and before you've even made it through the registration line, you've made friends that will probably be friends for life. And I know that sounds corny to those of you watching who've never been there, but Callie, back me up. <laughs> yes, no, it's 100% true. And and yeah, I, th I think that first road rally, I was obviously very introverted and timid and it was you know my first music convention. So I was just, I'm not sure I really talked to anybody. I was just absorbing it all and going to all the panels and everything. And I think it was my one-to-one -one mentor session. He had just met with Matt Vanderbilt and got his card. And I told him I was looking for producers and tracks and stuff. And he's like, I just I just talked to a producer, like take a picture of his business card. So it was just kind of <laughs> a roundabout way. But now I go to every music convention I can find. And it's amazing how there's this like core group of people that kind of go to all of them. And right. it's just one big like it's just an awesome reunion every time we all see each other i find it so funny and i would say this to vanderbo's face he might be watching for all i know but to hear the word producer in the same sentence with matt vanderbo is hysterical yeah. because when he describes how he started out in the beginning and he turned on pro tools and he said all he saw was a blank screen i didn't know what to do after that and now he's a known producer of tracks yeah yeah matt and marcus are legends they're amazing yeah the best um let's see i'm looking for my next question see how long does it take you I, I don't even know if you've ever kind of thought about how long it takes you but from the moment that you start working on a track and top lining it how long does that process take and then we'll talk about the vocal stuff after yeah so I would say if I'm if I'm writing the whole top line myself, it would probably take. Well, I mean, it's probably about the same as when I you know write with other top liners and stuff. But I mean, two, three hours I would say in terms of creating the top line um, when I'm writing it by myself. If I'm if I'm writing a co-write with other top liners and like the producer were having a Zoom write or something, it might take a little bit longer. But that's just because you're all vibing off of each other and you know. Um, so those might be like three or four hours, but they're more fun because you're getting to hang out with people. So, Has it, when you're writing with another top liner, and I imagine that's very much like, you know, uh, writing, uh, going to writing meetings on Music Row, for instance, um, how do you guys settle disputes when you are not in the same room, but you're Zooming? and somebody comes up with an idea that they're just absolutely in love with and you're sitting there thinking to yourself mm, maybe not uh, how how does that go do you feel free to just express that or do you have to be a bit of a psychologist what's the process um well luckily i i think i try to work with people that we're generally on the same page like we know what we're trying to to create and everything. And I don't think we try to guard our ideas or anything too much. Like we know we're writing for sync, so we're not gonna hold on to anything too, too hard. But if someone really does have an idea that they love, then generally like the producers on the call and the other top liner and I, so there's three of us and it's just kind of a majority rules. But I mean, everyone's always really chill. Like that's never much of an issue. That's cool. Uh, what's the largest number of people that you have ever co-written with on a particular song? Uh, I think I've done four on a song once, maybe five once. But this goes back to my like 
cold calculated business side of my approach <laughs> because I'm like, I'm writing for sync. I'm doing this for a living. Like I'm not trying to have a, a bunch of people on a song, you know, I try to keep it 50, 50 or, you know, three people at the most. So. Right. Um, somebody in the chat room just asked, what is a top liner? And there's still probably a lot of people out there that don't know what that is. So can you please define what it, what top line is? Yeah. So I am writing basically the lyrics and melody over a track. Someone will send me a track that sounds like a instrumental right off of the radio or something. And then I write the vocals that go on top of it. So we just approach it 50, 50 like that. Um, and do you have, well, uh, is for anybody that came late, a lot of people are actually showing up late. Um, some of the rules of advertising, if I may uh, be so bold as to summarize is emotionally up tempo, positive. The tracks are up tempo. They're empowering. Their I feel great, it's a great day. Is that all kind of a good summary? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say that's the general vibe for sure. We definitely saw a little bit of a shift um, at the beginning of COVID and stuff. The tone kind of switched to, a, oh, it's a togetherness. Like we're gonna get through this all, you know, uplifting, like more soaring kind of vocals. Um, but as a whole, and I think we've 100% switched back to normal at this point, but yeah, definitely more confident, swagger, attitude, upbeat, you know, just happy, happy, cool songs. I've noticed, and maybe it's just the commercials that I've been noticing, but I've noticed in the last year, there are more and more commercials that sound like they are tracks from a song and they've stripped out the lyric um, and, the, and the lyric melody and maybe replaced it with a little bit of instrumental melody to carry it. And have you noticed that trend at all where lyrics, like five years ago, lyrics were all over the place? Seems less so in the last year. I don't know if that's because of COVID um, or if it's just me that's noticed that. Any vibe on that from you? Yeah, I would say, in general, um, since I started writing for Sync and everything, my ad spots that have landed have been probably 50-50 instrumental versus vocals. Um, mm -hmm. But the the thing to keep in mind with that is even if the vocals don't make it into the ad, oftentimes they're kind of what can help sell the song to the music soup or the brand or whatever. They hear the song and they're like, oh my gosh, it sounds like such a cool like artist song or whatever. And unfortunately the, the vocals might not work um, with the ad, but they just loved the song so much that they then decide to use the instrumental um, and then have their own, you know, commercial dialogue over it. So. I think for the vocalists and top liners out there, like don't beat yourself up if your vocals don't make it on the ad. Like they probably still did play a role in helping land that spot. And uh, and then, you know, everyone still gets paid their normal cuts regardless of what version of the song gets placed, so. Do you ever feel like I could have just gone blah, 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 blah. i still got the money. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try that one time. Just do like a nonsense song. <laughs> see what happens. Um, how many songs three years ago or four years ago when you were just getting started on this, how many songs might you work on in a year versus how many you're working on now in a year? I don't know if you've ever done the math on that or not. Yeah, no, I, I actually keep pretty close tabs on, on that. Um, just because I was interested, because when I was first listening to all the taxi TVs and stuff, I, I kept hearing the numbers that for instrumentals and cues and stuff, people would need, you know, a thousand or two thousand cues or instrumentals to like really make a good living off of that. And I was just very curious. I said, you know, I, I wonder how many vocal songs you need. So I kind of kept track of that. Um, but I think when I was first getting into sync, I might have done 40 or 50 the first year and then I bumped up to 100. Wow. Um, last, was it last year or the year before? And I think I did 90 last year. And, and I think this year I'm hoping to keep it closer to like 75 or something like that. Um, but it's definitely, a, I don't want to say quantity over quality, but you definitely got to have a lot of tunes out there working for you. How do you meet most of your collaborators? Um. Well, I mean, back when conventions were happening and stuff, definitely at conferences and everything. Um, and now, 
libraries will pair me with some of their their favorite producers or or music supervisors will introduce me to producers that they think you know we'd vibe well together and everything um and then yeah i just try to keep everybody happy and <laughs> write with as many people as i can so but no it's it's cool so it's a full-time gig for you at this point, right? You're not like working at a church's fried chicken by day and writing at night. None of that. <laughs> no. And in fact, I gigged, um, I gigged for a living and then was gigging to kind of supplement my income as I was getting into sync and everything. And it was literally a miracle because I had been building up my, my sync job, I guess. Um, and then it got to the point where I said, okay, I think I'm ready to stop gigging. And I literally played my last gig on, what was it? I think it was January 17th of 2020, right before they shut everything down for COVID. So it was literally perfect timing. I felt like that was a miracle that I had actively decided to stop gigging. And then it just so happened all the gigs went away anyways. So, but I was able to then support myself with sync and uh, I've been full time sync ever since. So what you're saying is you caused the pandemic. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> all by yourself I, 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 my gigs in the country fell apart so no the whole damn world Kelly. <laughs> um do you ever miss doing the gigs i do i mean it was hard work obviously lugging all these big speakers around and climbing up to rooftop bars and everything but it was definitely it was it was fun i loved it i love the loop pedal and stuff and i think honestly playing covers for hours on end every week really helped ingrain structurally and, you know, rhyme patterns and schemes and everything in terms of just learning from that as from a songwriting perspective. So I think it was definitely helpful. Out of all the artists in the last five or 10 years, if I could wave my magic wand, uh, because I, this is it, my Bic magic wand, uh, and have you co-write with current artists that are out there who would your top three most desirable co-writes be oh my goodness i know Um, i I felt like a journalist when i came up with that one (laughs) (laughs) that's a good i love that no uh well i mean i love honestly i would probably say which are two different genres but probably ed sheeran and missy elliott like I, i love missy elliott and ed sheeran so Good choices. Um, do you ever hit a dead end where you get a great brief, you're supposed to be working on this track with somebody who you've probably got a relationship and successfully completed stuff, and you just fall flat. Uh, you just can't do it. Um, does that happen and how do you deal with it? Yeah, so I would say, well, 90, I would say 99% of the tracks people send me, I'm able to write to. I very rarely on occasion, I'm just like, I'm not, I'm not vibing with this one. Not that it's a bad track, but for whatever reason, I'm not personally connecting to it. So in those occasions, I just send it back and I'm like, go, go give this to another top liner because it's a dope track. I just, I don't feel like I can, I can turn out something of quality to that. But in terms of just a writing burnout, I mean... I know, you know, Matt and Marcus are turning out like two, 300 songs a year, which blows my mind. And I, I wish I was that prolific. Um, but for me, I definitely get burned out trying to do 100 songs a year. And whenever that happens, I just kind of take a step back. I maybe focus on pitching and admin for two, three weeks or something, try to find new music, new shows, whatever, um, get a little fresh inspiration and then just try to tackle it again maybe after two three weeks sometimes it's just good to like take a break from writing every now and then um because it's women's history month i've got to ask a a lady question uh do you notice any difference i don't know if this is sexist or not please forgive me if it is um any difference between collaborating with men versus women or women more emotionally in tune with each other or do you ever feel like you've got to be part of a boys club to work with the guys any of that stuff go on uh not so much i would say 99 percent of the people i work with are guys The, the only female i'm trying to think before i speak i'm pretty sure the only 
uh, other girl that I write with is Robin Shore. She's a top liner that I work with. Um, love her. She's amazing. But um, yeah, literally 99% of my collaborators are, are male. And I mean, it's just, yeah, it's been good. No issues there. I just, I don't know. I, I feel like it's just a male dominated industry in general. So, you know, in terms of how many females are doing it seriously is a little bit few and far between, but. I, I, I've i recognized that for years. I've done panels at the road rally that were, you know, basically the theme of the panel is why aren't more women doing this? And, and most of the women I talk to say, I'm just not that technologically adept, but yet there are plenty of women that use computers and deal with tech in so many other fields that I'm wondering why that doesn't translate to the music side of things. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but we've noticed that around here. The the taxi membership is skewed somewhat more male. Uh, I know that the readership of magazines like Recording Magazine or Electronic Musician are primarily male readers. And I just can't understand any reason why somebody's anatomy or gender should dictate their ability to do that stuff. Because I know plenty of guys that are technophobes and can't do it either. So just weird to me but i guess i can't solve that problem all by my lonesome but i'm aware of it and i do what i can um let's see writer's block have you ever hit the wall like mid project where it's like coming and it's feeling good and then boom i'm out and, and how do you deal with that um I don't think anything's happened like that mid mid project. Um, but if I am, you know, doing a Zoom right with a couple people, and you know, we've worked for three or four hours, and we still need a second verse and a bridge, then we're just like, you know what, we'll we'll pick this up next week, um, which is what we do. But we've never we've never, I guess, abandoned a project or just been like, you know what, this is this isn't working. We're just gonna you know walk away from it. You know, we always finish it in two three weeks max. I'm surprised you have that much time, honestly, because so many of the advertising briefs we get here at Taxi and just, I, I don't know if you know this about me, but prior to starting Taxi, I, I ran the two largest audio post facilities on the planet Earth, mostly for doing commercials. And I mixed them all day long, every day. I was always kind of shocked that the people from the agency would come in back then with a shopping bag with like quarter inch reel to reels and the little white boxes, sometimes even cassettes, eventually it became CD and they would come in uh, and we'd have a voiceover guy that would do, you know, Delta is ready when you are. And then they'd say, so what do you have for music? And we'd look in a music library, which was a paper catalog and, and boxes of quarter inch tapes. And then eventually it became um, CDs. And you would sit there and put in the CD. Do you like track one? No, track two. They came woefully ill-prepared on the music side of things. But they always had to have it done that afternoon because they were going back to make a presentation in the conference room to the client. Yeah. So I find that a lot of the advertising stuff, um, it's like music is the bastard stepchild. They wait till the last damn minute and it's really so important. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are times that you've got more of a, a time luxury going on. Is that two to three week thing kind of typical or do you run into those we need it tomorrow jobs? Yeah, so I actually don't write to briefs. Um, I definitely get briefs and I pitch songs that fit that are already, you know, in existence on my catalog and stuff. But um, yeah, I've never had much success writing to briefs. And I personally just try to write a good song that stands alone on on its own or stands, you know, and I, I would try to write songs that could work for 10 different brands than maybe, you know, just one or writing for a brief. Um, but I know there are a lot of people that have a lot of su success writing for briefs and everything. So it's just kind of a different approach. Um, and it definitely took a while to build up my catalog to the point where I felt like I, you know, could confidently pitch the briefs that were coming in and I had the right song for it or something like that. Um, Let's see, I've asked a lot of these already. Um, let's talk about your SAS factor. Um, it seems like many of the commercials, uh, many of the big placements that you've had in commercials, um, your delivery is very sassy. And I wanna know if you grew up 
like a, a sass mouth kid where the parents, your parents are always going like, you know, tone it down, Kelly. Or, or is that a character that you've developed because you found that it works well for the genre of TV commercial music? I would say, yeah, for the most part, it's something I developed. I would say I always had a slight, which why, I don't know, because I've basically grown up in Georgia, but maybe a slight valley girl approach. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can turn it on and off. But no, I think that was more more so a character um, that we just kind of randomly stumbled across. So I was actually in a co-ed with uh, Robin Shore and Jacob Paterecci when all of a sudden I was like, well, what about this kind of this vocal delivery? And they were like, what the heck is that? Like, we don't know. No one knows what to call it. It's not rapping. It's not singing. It's just kind of sassy talking, I guess. But um yeah, it's definitely a character I've discovered, um, and it. As soon as we learned that it was working, I just leaned into it hard. I mean, now almost every song I do has that kind of vocal delivery on it. So, don't don't fix it if it isn't broke. That's right, um, and you seem like you are in tune with the business side and smart enough to notice if you see a change on the horizon to. Um, jump on it as the change is happening rather than two years after going, oh, crap, missed the boat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's definitely important to stay on, on top of trends and stuff. And I'm I'm interested to see what's going to happen over the next few years because, you know, we went to we went from Imagine Dragons, which was more uh, male vocal dominated to I think we're very kind of female vocal dominated right now. But obviously the pendulum is going to swing again. So um, I'm excited to see. I guess where it goes next and I think it'll be fun to just kind of switch it up and go with that new direction when it happens um, okay your titles I want to I, I'm a huge proponent of great titles that telegraph what the song is going to sound like what the topic of the song is what the attitude the whole song and your titles are just great flex uh, walk Walk, do the talking, attitude, well, hello, showstopper, look at me, uh, do it like you, I like it, bad, do your thing, uh, throw it back. They're, they're all titles that are remarkably short and, and do such an excellent job of telegraphing. Does your brain think in hooks? Do you have to like sit down and go, oh, that title's too long, or that hook is too long, and you have to edit it down to its essence, or does it just come out of you like that now because you've been working on it for a while? Yeah, I think um, brevity definitely helps in terms of pitching and stuff. And whatever the tag is, I mean, obviously we're kind of strategic in, in what I write as the chorus and the tag of the song because we want it to work well for sync. But then whatever that tag is has to be the title of the song because, you know, if, if music supervisors or libraries are quickly scrolling through their, their catalog for a brief, they need to be able to get a pretty quick idea of what the song is about just by its title. So those are definitely very important. Um, your lyrics are often spunky, empowerment-based, full of attitude. Um, and yet I've heard songs of yours like Still Miss You or Close Your Eyes um, that are more tender and intimate, which are really, really good, by the way. Um, and then Bad and Neon Lights, which are less advertising like and more top 40 ish I would say um, is it hard shifting modes and becoming you know one minute your ad lady next minute your this person um, it, it seems like it's effortless to you because the quality of the materials there is it hard or is it you don't think about it uh, no, I mean, I love it. I just, I love being able to switch gears like that for different projects. And I've been lucky enough to um, work with a couple really talented DJs down in Brazil. Um, they're the ones that was on the song, um, like Still Miss You and, and Out of My Head and all those more dance tracks. Um, but those are definitely more written towards the artist world. Like those are released. Some of them are with um, labels and stuff down there. And, you know, we're more stream focused. You know, we're trying to get streams with those. Um, but no, I love it. I love to try to at least keep a, a toe in the writing for the artist world, you know, because um, it's, it's definitely fun to do both. Uh, how, how do the experiences differ working with different producers? 
um, or how much do the personalities, the styles, the workflows all come into play? Yeah, um, I would say the workflow is pretty similar with every with every every producer that I work with. Um, but what I love is, you know, I'll I'll, I'll send a, a reference to five producers and be like, hey, we're going for, you know, confident, sassy attitude vibes, and they're all going to give a distinctly different track because it's you know their own personal vibe it's how they interpret the brief um so i love how i can apply my my style and my sassy talking whatever that, whatever that is <laughs> to, to five different tracks and work with five different producers and they're all going to have their own kind of identity and sound and brand um like if I work with Marcus Cohen, like we definitely have a brand and a sound together um, versus when I write with, you know, Robin Shore and Jacob Federici, um, they're different sounds and they both serve their purposes. And I just love it because we're getting to have, it just helps expand the catalog, I guess. We're having a, a wider range of songs just by working with different producers. Got it. Um, let's see. Got that one covered. Um, some people might look at you where you're at in your career and think that things have gone remarkably well and been kind of easy because it's happened in a relatively short time and, and that you've arrived. I, I personally think that you have just cleared the launching pad, to, to put it in NASA terms, that you've definitely left the ground, you've cleared the tower, and you're heading for space. What's left on your horizon? What do you want to accomplish for the longer term in the bigger picture? Um, well, it's just been interesting, I guess, pivoting and changing my strategy as I grow and, and check off, you know, little goals along the way and everything. You know, I started out writing for film and TV and then I kind of pivoted over to advertising. And at first I was doing more vocal songs for advertising and now I'm doing the sassy talking and, <laughs> or even in, in the deals that I have with libraries, like the deals I have have changed and evolved as I've gotten more um, experience and more brands under my belt, you know, libraries are willing to maybe strike different deals um, or even, you know, reaching directly out to ad agencies and music supervisors and, and pitching that way kind of, um, I mean, I still work with a lot of awesome libraries, but I'm also starting to pitch directly to ad agencies and music supervisors. So that's changing. Um, but I think, I don't know, my, my next goal, one, I want to move out to LA this, this year. And then I don't know, so maybe. You, so you can pay 13% more taxes. What are you crazy? <laughs> I want to be out there with all the cool kids in LA. Um, they're all moving but, to Georgia. <laughs> we'll just like pass somewhere mid country. Um, but yeah, and then I don't know, I'm definitely, I mean, I really enjoy the business side. So I could see maybe starting up my own pitching agency in the next five years or something like that, just as everything continues to, to grow. Um, I think that might be a cool thing to do, but we shall see. I'm just kind of <laughs> learning as I go. Well, I, I have little doubt that you will accomplish great things. And then one last question before I turn it over to the uh, the questions from the chat room. And I, I want to say somebody in there keeps asking, like, where where do you what what agencies? Where how do you get this? How do you get that? They're looking for the keys to the kingdom. And I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten your name, but whoever you are, I'm not going to ask her that. Um, oh, Diane Kane, I think. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to ask her that. The reason is that you know, within the next 30 days, a couple thousand people will probably see this. So that means any company or any people she mentions that everybody and their brother is going to reach out. And um, honestly, we've had that happen before. And it's like, how did you hear about me when they piss them off? Oh, through taxi. So no, we're not going to ask that question. Sorry, Diane. Yeah, I don't um, want to get blackboard or anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I mean, first of all, it's like, you know, asking, can you tell me how to com compete with you? Which uh, generally taxi members are very generous with sharing information and contacts and stuff, but not on a video that's going to be seen by a lot of people 
what happens in person at the road rally over a cup of coffee is one thing. What happens in public like this, whole other thing. Um, and besides, we don't know you. Um, we do have people that will take those names and do crazy things with them. Um, so my last question before we turn it over to the chat room questions is, what advice would you give to young girls who look at you and think, I want to be like her? Um... I would say you, first of all, can do it. I like there will. I mean, this is true for anyone trying to start up their own small business or anything. But like, you're gonna have some serious moments of self doubt and imposter syndrome and <laughs> thinking you, you, you can't do it. You're not up to par. You can't compete. Um, but I've generally always had the approach of like, you know, I might not be the most talented person in the room, but I will definitely work the hardest. And I think for anyone um, or you know, girls trying to get into sync and everything. Just you gotta you gotta learn how to tune those voices out and just do it. If you feel deep down that you can write for sync and, you know, create a small business like that, then you can and you just have to learn to tune everything out and just focus on your goals and everything because we need more girls in the business, first of all. So We really do. <laughs> you know Yeah. You just reminded me of something, if I can tell a little Lasco family story. Uh, right after the earthquake happened in 94, I think it happened, I want to say January-ish, uh, my two daughters who were on the East Coast, I used to fly back and forth every other weekend to be with my kids when I moved out to L.A. And then when they got older, they would start coming out to L.A. for the summers um, for big chunks of time. So they came out shortly, like a few months after the earthquake, and my brand new wife and I were living in um, like a two bedroom apartment where, you know, stuff had fallen out of the sea. We had to move out of where we were living because it was destroyed in the earthquake. We moved into an apartment that was only kind of destroyed by the earthquake. And I was working 18 hours a day and I just felt terrible. My daughters are like here for the summer and my new wife or maybe she was yeah she was my wife at that point um she was getting a lot of the entertainment responsibility and i kind of felt like a terrible dad till one night one of my daughters said to me dad i, I apologized to my daughter and she said that's okay i've gotten something so much more special out of this trip and i said what 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 did you get and she said watching how hard you're work working and seeing that your company is starting to succeed because taxi was two years old at the time she said that's something i'll have with me for the rest of my life and she was like 10 or 11 years old when she told me that and so i've always um been able to feel better about the fact that i, I was an absentee father within 10 feet of my kids that summer because they got a gift so you're 100 percent right you can absolutely do anything in life you want to do it just it comes down to how hard how badly do you want it and do you want it badly enough to work really hard at it because mm -hmm. if you don't you are an imposter <laughs> yeah. all right let's take some questions from the chat room let's see um uh there's a little delay so it's going to take a moment um Okay, this is from Simon Burnham. Um, how many people do you have on your music production team, co-writers and music directors on a daily basis? How many people do you have on your music production team, co-writers and music directors on a daily basis? Um, I believe Simon is from Australia. Music director is not really a term we use here in the States. So um, how many people on your team? How many different pods of producers i think do you is the question do you work with yeah so i definitely have my uh core group of producers that i work with like almost weekly um and i would say that's maybe three or four producers and then i probably have another four or five that i maybe work with on a monthly basis um but yeah i would say there's maybe eight to 10 that I try to work with regularly. Um, and that's all about just, you know, finding the, the people that your styles gel with, um, gel together well, and just sticking with it. Because it is a long game. I mean, you can be writing for a year with someone before you get a placement. So you just gotta keep writing with them. Um, Charles Ryder wants to know, are your songs for ads full songs or mainly hooks with a verse? <laughs> 
So this is actually kind of funny. Um, the short answer is yes, they're full songs, um, normal song structure, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Um, but it's really funny, and Robin and Jacob and I always laugh because our my our biggest song ever, "Look at Me," um, is two minutes and seven seconds, and the second verse is the same as the first. <laughs> so, so it's um, it's. You, you, there's definitely some flexibility there. Um, but I think when you're working with songs like that, it's just important if the second verse is the same, um, just to introduce a slightly new maybe production element or something in the second verse, just so it's technically a new different section that the editors could pull from. But yeah, you don't have to be super stickler about it. You know, it could be the same verse or you could write something different. But yeah, generally just a normal song structure. Uh, talk to us about intros and bridges, two, uh, two parts of songs that rarely make it into, or, or less important in the sync world. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, uh, I would say bridges are the bane of my existence. I tell everyone that. I hate bridges. <laughs> <laughs> but I think particularly for sync, if you're, if you're going to do a bridge, honestly, if you could just do a, an oohs and ahs kind of, you know, gang vocals, um, not necessarily a lyrical section, but, you know, just like a, a whoa, whoa, whoa kind of part, um, that that would have a decent chance of syncing. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily worry about doing like a, I know at least like with country writing and stuff, it's, or pop, you're trying to like flip the song and add like a, a new perspective in the bridge or something. But for sync, um, you don't necessarily have to do that. You might not even need a bridge, but if you do, just you know, do a simple oohs and ahs or something like that. And then I guess for intros, I don't. We definitely include intros. Um, just have a couple like vocal ad libs or something, but just anything to get the songs over two minutes. That's that's what we're trying for. <laughs> um, people keep wanting to know where to hear your music, so Liz is going to post your taxi profile in the chat room, and also. Um, I, I went on YouTube and found a half dozen of your bigger sync songs on your YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I post, I, I try to post all my ads um, on my Instagram, which is Callie J Music. Um, but I also have, I release a couple songs um, on Spotify and definitely have lyric videos and stuff on YouTube. And lately I've been trying to post on TikTok. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm around. You can find me on different platforms. Can you come over and teach me how to use TikTok? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I figure it out, it's a, it's a complicated app. <laughs> uh, I, I actually have used it. it. It's so highly addictive that I think that they should make it illegal and make crystal meth um, legal because I think that TikTok is more damaging and more addictive than crystal meth. The next... Uh, uh, the you next season, the next version of Breaking Bad will be about people selling <laughs> access to TikTok. Um, somebody just had a great question. David Paul Zimmer wants to know: Can you talk more about how you focus on syllables within the verses and choruses? That's a great question. I'm sorry. Repeat the question. <laughs> uh, can you talk more about uh, your syllabic stuff, like how mm. you treat uh, your syllables and your rhythmic stuff when? when when you're building your, uh, was it verses or choruses? Uh, and verses and choruses. Can you talk more about how you focus on syllables within your verses and choruses? Yeah, so I think, I think space is also a really important thing. Um, because when you th you're writing for ads, so there's going to be dialogue and stuff. So whether it's the chorus or the verse, it's it's definitely beneficial to have space, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like rapid fire lyrics all the time. Um, you got to let the song breathe a little bit. Um, but yeah, in terms of like rhythm, I think I generally just try to go for a bouncy. I guess bouncy is probably the best word. Just something that's like. <laughs> it's so hard to just I like it. that. Just yeah. like, yeah, that. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to write, guys. Um, <laughs> what do you mean you don't understand? Um, yeah, no, I, I. it's hard to put it into words. But yeah, space and 
and even as a, a reference, like look at me, the ad libs, I never really realized how important ad libs could be in helping to sell a song because what's between every verse line and that song is a well, wow, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just threw it in there as like a, oh, it's a filler kind of ad lib thing. But honestly, that's what has sunk, I, <laughs> sunk the most. I mean, ad libs can also be really, really important in terms of writing for advertising and stuff. So just kind of a bouncy, but also leave space and, and room to breathe and have fun with the ad libs. <laughs> Um, several people have asked in different forms uh, how involved you get in the building of tracks or the final mixes of tracks. Do you mix your own tracks? So explain your relationship. I, I know the answer, and I think you kind of covered it talking about the producer side of things, but explain what you do, what you don't do. Yeah, so um, I generally have a pretty hands-off approach to um, my producers in terms of what like how they build the tracks and what elements are in there and everything. Um, and even a hands-off approach in terms of how they produce my vocals. So I, I track all my vocals here um, at my house and I tune them and align them with, you know, Melodyne, Vocaline, get it all nice and pretty and together. But I send them the raw stems and they're pretty much free to produce them however they want. Um, and because it is sync and we're you know trying to pump out songs and everything we we really don't kind of dwell on the the production too much i mean if it's a solid song that we feel could confidently get in a library and land some spots then we're not gonna pick it apart that's the thing about music it's so objective and you know it could be argued that a song is never done you just have to learn to recognize when a song is at the point where it can do the job that you wrote it for so, and then at that point, you just, you start pitching. Uh, did you happen to catch my interview with uh, Stephen Pressfield at the Road Rally, or have you read any of his books? Uh, I believe I sat in that one. Um, it's been a minute, but yeah, yeah I sat in that, that panel. Because uh, he addresses that issue, and he talks about Seth Godin, who's a, a kind of a a marketing icon who's I think I've read almost every one of Seth's books and I've read all of Pressfield's books at least many of them a couple or three times and he talks about shipping shipping is like it's done we got to get it out the door because you can beat it to death and, and you've defeated the purpose of creating it in the first place so yeah. it, I like the fact that you recognize that there's a point where you go it's good enough to do the job ship it get it out the door yeah, exactly. And for sync, I mean, you never know if a song is actually going to place or not. So you have to be a good, a good judge, a good steward of your time also and know like, you know what, we've invested enough time in this song and it's time to move on to, to something else. Because at some point you might cross the line of like where you're maybe not making up the, the money that you make with that song isn't justifying how much time you spend on it. So it's just a balance. It's learning what that, what that sweet spot is for you and your music. Yeah, it's really hard for a lot of people to, because they get very precious about stuff. And I understand that. I'm not putting them down for that. It's their art. It's their, they're birthing a creation, which to them in that moment is like a child. And they can't let go of the fact that it's, it's also a product. And I know people don't want to commoditize music. Um, but I've never met anybody like you or Matt or Marcus or any of the successful taxi members that feel like in the process of understanding that music is a product that they've sold their soul or they turn out crap that they're not proud of. None of them. As a matter of fact, many have said, no, I'm actually way more proud of this stuff than I am of the artist stuff I used to try and do. That was the crap. The stuff yeah. that I'm doing now is a discipline that you learn and you can be proud of it. So is, is that a feeling that you have as well? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's it's important to not be too, too precious about the songwriting process or even the song once it's finished. I mean, we're creators. We have an unlimited well of creativity within us. So I don't think we necessarily need to guard our song so much. Um, I would rather have it out there in the world um, and trying to get opportunities with the music than keeping it on a shelf being like, oh, it's not ready yet. You know, I'd rather risk it. You got to risk it for the biscuit, y'all. <laughs> now that's from Georgia. 
<laughs> Here's a question from Ken Mesford. Uh, do you use a particular DAW that everyone in your circle uses, or do you just get WAV files? Uh, I would say most of my producers probably use Logic. I track my vocals on Pro Tools. I don't know why. <laughs> That's just like what I was used to. Um, but yeah, they they send me out just like a printed wave of the, the instrumental. I don't get like individual stems of anything. Um, so they just send me like an MP3 or a wave. And then I bounce out my stems um, and just send them to the producer and then he throws them into his session. Um, Pat Wara wants to know, 100 songs a year is very productive. How do you manage to write that many songs? Uh, it's definitely it's definitely a challenge, for sure. I think 100 is, is my max. Um, but I just, I try to think of it as a, it's a week by week thing. I mean, if you think, oh, I, I just have to write two songs this week, you know, um, it's not quite as daunting. Um, but yeah, it's just important to stay inspired and write with people that push you and keep you inspired and vice versa. You can keep each other inspired and it's just fun. And, and getting to write to new sounds and new references and stuff just helps keep everything fresh and exciting so you can keep going and try new taglines and everything. Um, I just saw one from Songs from a Headband question, Callie, are you in the Six Figure Club and your yearly earnings along with some taxi members? I'm not going to ask you to disclose your income, um, but it's a fair statement to say your entire income is from music at this point. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Uh, here's a question from Dan Winkles. Uh, is having a team of writer producers essential for success in songwriting in any capacity? Having a team? Yeah, yeah. for sure. I mean, I could, I could never have done this without uh, collaborating with people. I mean, I, I have no idea how to produce a track. So I definitely um, have to seek out producers and um, collaborate with people all the time. And I think it's crucial. And also being strategic in who you collaborate with for certain projects too. You know, if, if I'm writing a song for film and TV, there are going to be people that I go to. If I'm writing um, with ads in mind, there are going to be producers I go to. Uh, or even certain vibes, you know, like Robin Shore just brings like an awesome vibe um, from a top line perspective. I love her. Her energy is just amazing in the co-write. So it's just finding people that complement what you bring and complement and contrast so that, you know, it, it's it's definitely, definitely important to have a, a good team of people that you work with. Did you meet Robin at a Taxi Road Rally? I actually met Robin at, I believe it was the Hawaii Songwriting Festival in, might have been 2018? Yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it was 2018. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've met almost all of my collaborators at either the Taxi Road Rally or Hawaii or one of the Durangos or stuff. So it's important to, it's important to go to the rally, y'all. <laughs> Which is ironic for a person not unlike myself that... You know, I'm not anti-social. I'm just not social. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I actually I was, bought, I'm sorry. Go ahead. ahead. No, I was just, I was saying I was shocked to find my way of life was called quarantine when COVID happens because like my day to day didn't really change much. I never leave my house. <laughs> <laughs> Mine either, other than I work from home in, instead of the office. But yeah, you know, Deb and I go to a movie once a week and, and we sit there and watch all the credits, of course. But yeah, not much of a social life. Um, I've got a t-shirt that says, I was social distancing before it was cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was. Um, there's somebody that keeps saying, he's not answering my question. He's not answering my question. Um, question. And I just haven't seen it. Uh, here's one from Matt Vanderbo. Um, yeah. Your hair is so much better than Stephen Baird's. Okay, that's not really a question. It's just a statement, and, and you do. You have much better hair, much better hair <laughs> than <you>. Steve. <laughs> have you ever done anything with Baird? I don't believe I have. Actually, I've definitely heard his name. Like I've heard his stuff. He's awesome. Yeah, but I'm not. Yeah. I had him on the show very recently. Okay, here's a question from Nicole, Chris. Nicole, Chris. 
Has most of Kelly's opportunities been non-exclusive or exclusive? And what advice would you give to those starting off in sync? Okay, let's take each one of those as a question. Uh, exclusive or non-exclusive? So I would say I generally, it's just on a song by song basis, but I probably sign about half my catalog away um, exclusively. And then the other half I try to keep um, non-exclusive. And I would say, even my approach to that though has kind of changed as I've gotten you know deeper into sync and everything, because um, there were certain deals, certain exclusive deals that you know I had no problem signing at first because you're just like grasping, trying to trying to get your foot in the door. Um, but now, now that I have you know some experience under my belt and stuff, and I know what my music can do, I've also kind of changed what deals I'm interested in. Um, so. I'll definitely sign stuff away exclusively, but not in perpetuity. Um, I don't do that. I definitely have quite a bit of songs signed away in, in perpetuity, but I, I try not to do that anymore. So, but it's also just your personal comfort level, you know, as it's whatever you as a writer are comfortable with. Um, I like to have a lot of different eggs in a lot of different baskets. So it's just kind of a, on a song by song basis. I'm glad you brought up eggs and baskets. There are so many people I know that as soon as they get some love right off the bat from a publisher or music library that taxi forwards a song, then they speak to the publisher or the library for the first time. and Oh, do you have other stuff like that or any other styles that I should hear? Yes, I do. Oh my gosh, they just signed 17 of my songs. And I always cringe at that. On one hand, I'm happy for them that they've built a relationship, especially through taxi and we get to brag about it. But on the other hand, you don't know for a while if that relationship is going to bear any fruit or not. So mm -hmm. I always advise people, as tempting as it is, it's like, wow, I just signed 17 songs. I would give them two or three or four and yeah. give them a year and see if anything pops. Most of them aren't going to get any syncs, but yeah. maybe one of them is that thing that resonates with the marketplace and gets synced over and over again. And But you have to look at... Am, it, do you agree with my opinion? I'm going to turn this into a question because I'm going to act like a professional here. Um, that different libraries have different clientele. Uh, yeah. We both know one publisher that does a lot of daytime television stuff and tends to use songs that are like kind of modern R&B because there are certain scenes that take place in a certain setting that require that kind of music. Um, there are other people that are very tuned in to TV commercials, other libraries that work a lot with um, reality TV shows. So they each have their own type of client that generally asks for a certain kind of music. So you could find out about a library that's had a million placements, but they're all in reality TV. So if you give them a song that would be great for a TV commercial, they might have nobody from commercial from an ad agency coming to them saying, what you got? Yeah, no, that's an extremely, extremely important part of just the strategy in terms of, because not only do you have to be strategic when writing your music, but you also have to be strategic in terms of pitching and trying to just get the best, the best chances for your music and everything. And back when I was uh, starting and, you know, trying to get my foot in the door, I was sending music to anyone and everyone I was working with, you know, I think I had non-exclusive music in like 25 libraries. Um, but like Michael said, there's, you know, different libraries have different clients and different shows that they're pitching to or ads or, you know, vice versa. And it really just kind of boils down to after a while, you can see who's consistently having more success with your music. And I do think you kind of have to cast that wide net at first to see what libraries are having success with your music. Um, but after a certain point, you can kind of start to dial back and fine tune who you're sending your music to um, and be more strategic in that sense. Um, because you also don't want to necessarily like oversaturate. If people can find your music like everywhere, um, that might not be as beneficial to you as if they could only find it in you know a couple spots. So it's all just, it's all strategizing, you know. I'm so happy to hear you talk about this stuff because um, so many musicians are just so, for lack of a better way to describe it, just so horny for anything to happen with their music. It's like, please, dear God, please let something happen. And then when any little spark happens, they just like 
don't think strategically. I'm, I'm in love with the fact that you're such a strategic thinker and it's becoming, not only are you talented musically, but it's becoming more and more obvious to me as I get to know you better in this interview that there's a reason this stuff is happening for you beyond the music. So good job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, really. I'm, it's, I, I can't think of the last time a musician even uttered the word strategy to me. <laughs> It's just I'm an overthinker. I just lie awake at night trying to figure out. <laughs> just, yeah, overthinking. But no, strategy is very important. And I know even for me personally, like I've been having to kind of figure out and weigh the pros and cons because there's like there's this one real high profile, very big, well-known library um, that I've been pitching some of my music to. And we have a great relationship. Like I, I love them. Like they've gotten me a couple good spots. But I'm definitely not having the success with them that I'm having at another place. So it's also just the ability to be able to set aside, like, I really like these guys. Um, and I think they run a great operation. But maybe my music just isn't the best fit for their clients. So as much as I want to continue, and maybe you toss them a song every now and then, but it would be smarter to, you know, focus more of your your songs towards the the libraries that are are having success with your music so you just gotta take that all into consideration have you ever had a library owner call you or email you it's like hey you've been a little dormant with me lately and i noticed that you've got a lot of other activity with x y or z uh has anybody ever pegged you for that or that they just accepted as she's probably got her reasons yeah, I definitely experienced that a bit, particularly when I was shifting more from film and TV to ads. Um, there were some more like film and TV focused libraries that I had been working with quite regularly that I kind of slowly faded away from. And that's not because I don't think they're great libraries. It's just because I've kind of changed my direction as a writer and stuff. So my music isn't naturally a good fit for them anymore. So, right. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know you better uh, and, and getting the answers to these questions. I think looking at the chat room, um, everybody's loving it and saying all kinds of great stuff. Um, I hope that we have a road rally uh, in person this year. I hope, you know, I'm literally like taking it day by day. I want to do a, a, an in-person road rally. I don't want to throw one and have nobody show up because we're all still trepidatious. So we'll see. I'm going to wait a couple more months before the hammer falls on that decision. But in either case, I would love to have you back either on stage at the road rally. We can both take a Xanax backstage before we go out there. <laughs> no, kidding. <laughs> kidding. Um, <laughs> um, or, or do another one of these. Um, you know, uh, at a virtual rally, if it comes down to that. But you're, you're a great interview subject, and I'm just so proud of you. I'm just in love with the fact that you're combining this creative output with a business head. It's like, man, uh, I always tell people, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you see me standing at the foot of your bed with a Q-tip, I'm only there to get your DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I learned a lot of the tips and tricks from listening to, to Taxi TVs when I was first getting into the, the business. So this has been an awesome, like, I'm honored to be here tonight. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for sharing, sharing your wealth of knowledge and inspiring people. And I hope that out there somewhere is another 12-year-old little Callie J that goes, I want to be just like her because they will have picked a really great role model. So thank you, Callie. Great thank for, you. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Thank See you. you soon. Thank you. And good night, you guys in the chat room. See Bye. you tomorrow. Oh, by the way, don't forget to subscribe if you're not a subscriber. There, I'm doing my business stuff. Give us a thumbs up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. There you go. Give us a thumbs up. <laughs> And uh, I will see you tomorrow for Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour right back here at the same channel, 4 o'clock. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.